when I broke this card down a week ago, I was pretty harsh. I kind of railroaded this card. We talked about the inordinate amount of fighters on this card coming off of losses. In fact, 17 of the 24 fighters on this card are coming off of losses. I talked about how this might be the worst main event we have ever seen. We have a guy that was just unconscious face down on the canvas versus a guy that hasn't won a fight in four years. But I've had a full week to relax, to reflect, to chill. Empty week. And I'm here to double down. This is literally the worst card we have ever seen. I have never seen a worse card, at least as far as name recognition is concerned. Certainly, these fighters might show up and put on the show of the century. But as far as rankings are concerned, as far as career trajectory is concerned, almost every single fighter on this card is coming off of a loss. None of these fighters are ranked. And the only decent matchup outside of the co-main event was canceled. My name is Angelo, this is We Want Picks, and I'm going to break down the atrocity that is UFC Vegas 91. I'm going to give you my picks, my predictions, and my bets. But before I do, please go watch my vlog. Please. For every single UFC pay-per-view, we cook some food, we have some friends over, we watch the fights, we react to fights. It's a very different piece of content. I understand that. We've got 24,000 subscribers, and most of you are here for the picks and the breakdowns. But some of you want a little bit of a peek behind the curtain. If you want to see how ridiculous I look in my outfit for the daddy-daughter dance or watch me make some rotisserie wings, check out the Fight Foods Vlog. We do film one of those for every single UFC pay-per-view. It's right here on this channel. Just go to the video section. And what kind of intro would this be if I didn't plug premium? Premium membership is only $10 a month. Premium membership is by far the most versatile, comprehensive membership in this space. You guys are here for insight, information. Some of you are here for entertainment. You got me on in the background while you're doing some work to kill some time. That's fine. But if you're here to pick up a couple of tidbits to help yourself make a couple of dollars, make these fights a little more exciting when you watch them, well, sign up for premium membership. It's freaking $10. It's $10 a month. And for that $10, you are going to get all of our picks, all of our bets, all of our insight. You're going to get an artificial intelligence. You're going to get picks and bets for other promotions, but you're also going to get tools, insight, and information. One of those tools is the line movement tracker. I already have three bets on this card, and I beat the line on every single one of them. We will talk about those in the breakdown. You can unlock the line movement tracker. Just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It's only $10, as I mentioned. You're also going to get the detailed data, metrics, and analytics. This has been up for an entire week. The rest of the world took a week off. Not Big Ange. Big Ange was here. Gave you a breakdown last Sunday, as I do every single Sunday. And Big Ange made sure the metrics were on the website. Made sure the picks were on the website. Made sure the AI did what it did for the website. You're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. Every Friday, after the weigh-ins, because the weigh-ins can be chaotic, and that will affect DraftKings ownership projections. We get the numbers on the board. They are quite literally the best in this space. If you play DraftKings Fantasy and you know how important ownership projections are, the $10 a month, I mean, the ownership projections are worth far more than that. And there are giant websites like Awesomeo, like Loro Grinders, charging way more. They're charging $65, $150 per sport. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. You're going to get the DraftKings ownership projections that will be preloaded into the optimizer. You're also going to get far more than just this handsome mug. You're going to get Artem. Artem just crushed PFL. He also does Dana White Contender Series and all the regional shows as well, giving you his picks, his bets, and his breakdowns. We are smack in the middle of PFL season, and that's going to roll right into Dana White Contender Series. You're also going to get the Pick Doctor. This is an artificial intelligence. We have a nuclear physicist that developed an artificial intelligence. He was a fan of the show. He reached out. He said, guess what? I'm a genius. I've already built this tool. Let's work together. Let's get this on the site. So we've done that. We've gotten it on the site. He's refined it. There's a whole bunch of technical jargon and explanations about how it even freaking works because I don't understand it, but it does. And it does pick at a very solid accuracy. Obviously, there are ups and downs, and obviously, there are caveats. It works off of data. If you have a UFC debut, there's not really a ton of data there. But we do have all of the caveats written out, all of the explanations, all of the information, and all of the picks for this card on the site ready to go. Everything I just mentioned, only $10 a month. We want picks.com. Click become a member.
Let's go ahead and break down this card. I did mention we lost the fight. I broke this down last week. We had 13 fights. We are now down to 12 fights. We lost the Gabe Green fight. And according to the comment section, he was everybody's favorite underdog this week. And I do think he might have actually flipped to a favorite right before that fight was dropped. It is Gabe. He's the one who pulled out of the fight. So he's gone. He's off the card. And they'll probably find a replacement for Yantop. But let's go ahead and break down what we do have. And what we do have to open up the card is Mahashete taking on Gabriel Benitez. What a banger this is, guys. What an absolute banger. We got Mahashete coming off two losses. We got Gabriel Benitez coming off a submission loss to a 40-year-old Jim Miller. This is a banger. If this doesn't set the tone for this card, I don't know what does. They're like, here you go, guys. UFC Vegas 91. We're going to give you a guy that lost two in a row versus a guy that was just finished. Enjoy the product. Oh, and it's not even going to be free on ESPN, which ESPN's not free, but it's not even going to be free with your, your cable that you pay for. It's going to be on ESPN Plus. So you're going to have to pay for it, but here's the product you're paying for. The only upside to these absolutely horrific fight nights, and it's not the fighter's fault because... Gabriel Benitez is going to come out here. He's going to fight his ass off, whether he was ranked third in the world or 50th in the world. He's going to fight. He's going to do his best. So is Mahashete. So this isn't dogging the fighters because obviously the UFC has a massive roster and not everybody can be the best in the world. Not everybody can have a ranking next to their name. Not everybody can be on a 10 fight win streak. That's just not how this works. There's always a best and then it works its way down. So I'm not dogging the fighters. What I am dogging is the UFC not taking a healthy mix of ranked fighters, a healthy mix of fighters who a win can get them into a title contention and mixing that in with the journeymen, the older, the aging out fighters, the people you're using to build superstars. Basically, what the UFC has done this year is they've turned it into boxing. If you know anything about boxing, I'm gonna put chapters. You wanna skip past this bullshit, go for it. If you know anything about boxing, Typically, boxing has a big-ass main event and then a bunch of crap you've never heard of. And that's what the UFC is doing, except they're just using the fight nights as a bunch of crap you've never heard of, and the pay-per-views are the big main events. They're having stacked pay-per-views. UFC 299, objectively spectacular. 300, best card any of us have ever seen. 301 is decent. And while the main event is wild... The other fights on that card are very good. They mean something. There's a bunch of ranked fighters. But anytime, as we know, the UFC goes to another country, we get a little bit of a watered-down product. 301 is good. 302 is good. 303 is spectacular. The pay-per-views in 2024 are going to be enormous. The fight nights are going to... It's, it's, I mean, it's the leftover dingleberry when a dog scrapes his butt across the carpet. It is what it is, but we're going to break down this card. We have Gabriel Benitez coming off that loss to Jim Miller taking on a Mahashete, coming off two losses in a row. This could be a fun fight, though, because Gabriel Benitez is an absolute gamer. He is a very good kickboxer. He's specifically, he's famously known for how well he kicks. There's a quote back in the day, probably 10 years ago at this point, where Crazy Bob Cook, or maybe it was Javier Mendez, one of the head coaches at American Kickboxing Academy said, and I, I said Academy instead of Academy, said that Gabriel Benitez is the hardest kicker in the gym. And when he said that, that included Luke Rockhold. That included Cain Velasquez. And I texted somebody that I know that spent quite a bit of time in American Kickboxing Academy, and this was months ago, and I said, listen, there's this quote floating around that Gabriel Benitez is the hardest kicker at American Is this true? And the reply was, it could be true. We've never actually tested it, but he, I tell you right now, he hits real hard. He kicks very hard. It could be true. And that's an objective statement, meaning that was just two people texting privately. And the fact that Cain Velasquez is there and Gabriel Benitez could be the hardest kicker in the gym is crazy. The problem is he's sort of gotten away from those kicks because when he can work in that kickboxing and he gets into a flow state and he ends his exchanges with kicks, he has a ton of success. He does have some grappling tools. He does have some decent BJJ, but he doesn't use them. He does hang out for a kickboxing match. He only has two takedowns and 14 UFC fights. He has fallen in love with chasing the knockout, and we have seen that over time with lots of other fighters. You knock somebody out, and then that's just who you become, and that's what you chase from that point on. He is coming off that loss to Jim Miller where he just wasn't in that flow state. He threw one punch at a time. There were not combinations. He didn't flow well. He didn't look like the spectacular kickboxer that know who he can. Damn, man. That know who you put. I had a full stroke. A full, and I felt like this video was going well, honestly. You, you would have seen no cuts up until this point. And then I said, 
of the, 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 the full stroke. He's taking on Mahashete. Mahashete, super young still. He's only 24 years old. He does have some solid composure in the octagon. He is a fun, creative striker. He'll hang out for a firefight or he'll dance around the outside for a technical kickboxing match. He's a little young, so he makes young guy mistakes and he'll let you dictate if the fight's a firefight or if it could be a technical kickboxing match. He's not the one who dictates and that'll just come with experience and time. He can have success getting you know, in a nice technical war because he does have some technique there. But you could also have success if you just pressure. If you pressure him, if you stay in his face, you back him up, you can find his chin. You can get him out of sorts. He doesn't fight well moving back, but he does do a good job when he can hang on the outside. He's plenty tough, and he will stick around. This is sort of a young prospect versus an aging vet kind of matchup. Mahashete is still a kid. I mentioned he does make some kid mistakes, but he should be faster, stronger. He should be all the things that matter in a sport like this. So I am going to pick Mahashete, but with like the tiniest, the tiniest sliver of confidence. And that's literally only because Gabriel Benitez looked pretty bad in his last fight. But he had a layoff. He was coming back after a decent layoff there. And sometimes, as we've seen, a fighter comes back after layoff, they lay an egg, and then they got that out of their system, and then they're good to go in their next fight. So Gabriel Benitez is actually a pretty good underdog on this card. I am going to pick Mahashete because recency bias. Then we have Ivana Petrovic taking on Na Liang. Another banger, I told you. They're setting the tone early. Boom. We're going to open up the card with two losses in a row versus one loss in a row. Well, guess what? The next fight on the card, we got one loss. Ivana Petrovic in her UFC debut versus Na Liang, who's never won a fight in the UFC. Three losses in a row. Boom. Set the tone. Let's go. Let's rock. Get the boys over. We got a fight night on Saturday. We got Ivana Petrovic, only seven fights in her entire career. She is pretty well-rounded, though. Busy striker, mostly a grappler. She's got some solid wrestling, heavy pressure, good BJJ. She will work you against the gauge, drag you to the ground, immediately start working for a submission. She only has seven professional fights. She did fail her first actual test in her UFC debut against Luana Carolina, where she had some success with two takedowns, but she was just dominated in the striking. She's taking on Na Liang. If we're looking at... Just the sheer MMA experience, not even close. Na Liang, 19 and 7. Na Liang has more losses or the same amount of losses than Ivana Petrovic has total fights. And you're going to say, wow, she's got 19 wins. That's a ton of experience. That's a lot of wins. And then if you look a little deeper, wow, 17 of those 19 wins are stoppages. But then if you spend a half a second and click on one of those names, you're going to see it's a hollow dog shit. She beat a whole bunch of nobodies. She beat a whole bunch of people with upside down records. And her record, the 19-7, and seven, is very, very padded. But that doesn't mean Na Liang is without skill. She's a very good wrestler. She will get takedowns. She's very, very good at closing the distance, at getting fights to the ground. And I think she's taken down everybody she's ever fought or close to it. Multiple takedowns at that. The problem is if she doesn't get a takedown or even after she gets a few takedowns, she doesn't know that's it. That's the end of it. I got my takedown. Apparently, in her mind, you get the takedowns and then the fight's over because that's how she fights. She gets takedowns and then that, she's done. Okay, I'm here. Can I get my points? Are we done here? And that's the problem with Na Liang. Like, you can count on her. You can count on her to get takedowns. And then you could also count on her to get finished shortly after. That's what just happened with J.J. Aldrich. Third loss in a row. She had a couple of takedowns early. Nothing outside of that. And then the loss. Na Liang is going to look good in this fight for a couple of minutes. She'll get a few takedowns. She'll have Ivana out of sorts, and then she's going to fade. She'll probably get swept. Eventually, she'll get finished, and that's the unfortunate reality of watching a Na Liang fight. So the pick is going to have to be Ivana Petrovic. Pretty confident in that pick because she's more durable, and she's more well-rounded, and she doesn't just stop after getting a takedown. What I will say, there could be some money to be made here. We'll see what we get with the round line. Maybe we get one and a half or even better. We get two and a half and then we go the under. We'll see what we get. It is a women's MMA fight and they tend to just default two and a half rounds on that. But where the money could be made is prize picks. If you guys don't know, I do a prize picks video. I release it every Thursday. If you're a premium member, you see the prize picks picks on Tuesdays. And prize picks is daily fantasy. You just say more or less than the numbers. And they may have Na Liang at a half a takedown. Or they may overjuice it and have it at three takedowns, something absurd. 
And I have had a ton of success recently with prize picks. The UFC 300 prize picks swept the board. The event before that swept the board. The event before that swept the board. Prize picks has been dominating. And anytime you get a female fight where somebody's a dominant wrestler, they tend to screw up those takedown lines and the minutes. So keep an eye out for that prize picks video. Ivana Petrovic is going to be the pick here. And if we do get a two and a half round line, I'll tell you right now, bang, under. Then we got Mark Mann taking on Ketlin Souza. Take a guess. Take a guess which one of these women won their last fight. I'll wait. You can comment it. None of them. Neither one. We got Marnik Man. Third fight of the evening and nobody, nobody stepping into the octagon coming off a win. We got Marnik Man coming off a pretty wrestle-heavy loss in her UFC debut. Taking on Ketlin Souza coming off a submission loss in her debut. Two women yet to win a fight in the octagon. But this could actually be a fun fight. And again, trashing the recent records, trashing the quality of the card is more about the UFC not mixing things up than it is about each individual fighter. Marnik Mann came in there and fought her ass off. She was just too small. She got bullied. She got taken down. That's what happened in her last fight. Ketlin Souza, a little overzealous, and she ended up getting submitted in her last fight. But the reality is, these two women are going to come out here and they're going to fight hard. And this could be a very exciting fight because Marnik Mann, her nickname, and it's a spectacular nickname. It's like the sawed off baddie or something, sawed off shorty. I just told you it's a spectacular nickname and you'd think I would know what it is. That was very misleading, but she's short as shit. That's why it's the sawed off. It's almost like you cut a regular human in half and then bang, Marnik Mann. But she does fight very fun. She has a fun, aggressive style. She's well-rounded. She's going to move forward, throw a ton of strikes. She'll look to wrestle. She'll look to grapple. She has no issue coming forward. She has no issue getting into a slugfest. And then she'll transition into wrestling. On top, if she gets you there, she's going to pound away. She's going to hang out. She's going to create a scramble. She's going to stay busy. She'll look for stuff along the way. She will chase four submissions. She has had a rough run in the UFC so far. I should have a weird pause there. Because she does struggle to keep fights standing or work off of bottom. You can take her down. That is her biggest problem. She's taking on Ketlin Souza, another pressure fighter. Two women that are going to come forward and just clash right in the middle of that cage. She's got heavy strikes. She'll work in an occasional takedown. Everything she does is heavy. She'll throw big kicks. She'll throw big punches. She will crush with big elbows, and she's always looking to do damage. She is a solid grappler when it gets to the ground, but she does rely on strength instead of technique to get it there. She's also coming off of a loss. And it was also her UFC debut. She was taken down and submitted in under two minutes. I got to go with Ketlin Souza here. She's going to be the pick. She is also a healthy favorite. She might, no, she's not the biggest favorite on the card. Um, we have a fighter in a little bit that's the biggest favorite on the card, but she's close to it. She's a four to one favorite. I don't agree with that line. Marnik Mann is a cannonball. Marnik Mann is tough. She's going to move forward. She's short, which makes things tricky. Obviously, she's been taken down plenty of times. But it does make things a little trickier. If you're used to fighting with somebody straight in front of you, you're used to fighting at a certain range, at a certain level, and then you have you know, the dude from good times in front of you, all of a sudden it's a little harder to hit somebody that you're looking at the top of their head. Marnik Mann is tough though, and she will come forward, and she will stay in your face. This will be a dogfight. Over two and a half is probably the safest play you're going to get here because Marnik Mann is incredibly tough. I don't <laughs> Ask me what the hell I just said there and why. Marnik Mann is incredibly tough. And even though Ketlin Souza hits hard and Ketlin Souza was just finished, I think we're over two and a half is going to be safe here. Ketlin Souza is the pick and pretty confident that she will get it done here. Then we have Dante Mays taking on Kayo Machado. I'll pause. We'll take a second. You guys can comment which one of these fighters you think won their last fight. And you are correct. Neither one of these fighters won their last fight. We got Dante Mays. He is coming off that decision loss to Rodrigo Nascimento. Taking on Caio Machado. He's coming off a decision loss to Mick Parkin in his UFC debut. This is another tricky fight. Because Dante Mays, good heavy-handed boxer. He's got solid footwork. He'll set up combinations well. He'll march forward. He'll throw everything with 100% intent. And he will look for that knockout. He'll even throw big heavy leg kicks. Obviously, tremendous overhands. He's not a wrestler, but he does have seven takedowns in the UFC. He is coming off that loss to Rodrigo Nascimento where 
He just couldn't hang with the strike. He was not the better striker in that matchup, even though he did have some power. But he did defend three takedowns. Take it on Kayo Machado. He's a dog. At a certain point in this fight, he was a decent-sized dog. I imagine he's going to flip to a favorite come fight night. He's a well-rounded guy. He is the newer generation of heavyweight, meaning he's busy. He can be fast. He's not a tremendous human being. He'll chill around 250 pounds. He's not big. He's not slow, but he's there. He's a good size, and he's athletic. He's not a big one-punch guy. Not the cleanest striker either, unfortunately, but he does have good volume, good footwork. He'll back up while throwing counters. He'll push forward with jabs. He has nice clinch work. Okay takedowns and underrated BJJ. I did mention he's coming off a loss to Mick Parkin where he controlled the striking, but he was taken down three full times. Dante is a good size favorite in this matchup. Two to one favorite on some books. He obviously has the experience advantage here. He does have one punch power. He's the more dangerous fighter in this matchup. But I think Kayo is the better, more technical striker in general. I think Kayo can hang around the outside, use the footwork, piece up Dante. And then I think Dante's not going to have success with those big shots. So he's going to look to wrestle. The wrestling's not great. Kayo should be able to defend those takedowns and just win a heavyweight decision. Heavyweight fights go two ways. You either get a quick finish or a decision that's kind of boring and sloppy with lots of cage control. This is most likely the boring, sloppy, lots of cage control decision, but I am going the dog here in Cayo Machado. Then we have Austin Hubbard taking on McCall Figlack. I'll wait. And you are correct. Nobody's winning fights here. We got Austin Hubbard. He's coming off that loss to the Ultimate Fight in the Ultimate Fighter finale. And McCall Figlack. And while he actually, his record is solid, And he's not coming off an atrocity of 12 losses in a row. He is coming back after a two-year layoff. So I don't even know if his recent wins count. But this could be a really fun fight as well. And I do have a bet on this fight. And I did beat the line movement. We got Austin Hubbard. This guy is a gritty guy who is very good everywhere. He's got a ton of heart, a ton of power in his hands. Mostly a striker, but he's pretty well-rounded overall. He can be taken down. But he does have a solid get-up game if he is. This is his second run in the UFC. His original stint was peak COVID, 2019 to 2021. He went three and four. Cut. Did some regional stuff. Got a few wins. Got thrown on the Ultimate Fighter. Worked his way to the finale. And he did just lose in that fight. He's taking on McCall Figlock. I mentioned the long two-year layoff. But he is very good. Powerful striker. Solid grappler. He's very aggressive in his style. He's always plotting forward. He likes to control the middle of the cage really well. He can be hittable, but it does not stop him from moving forward. He's got very good wrestling, but he uses it defensively more than anything. When he does take shots, they are clean doubles. His head is on the outside and he'll run it. All around, Figlak is very good, but he is hittable. And he is coming off a two-year layoff that had some injuries in the mix there. I always worry about strikers with long layoffs. If we go back to UFC 300, there were three fighters with layoffs of a year or more. None of them won. They all lost. All three of them lost. And that could be the situation here. And all three of them were strikers. And that is where it gets tricky. When a wrestler takes a few years off, they get in the cage. As soon as they get a hold of you and they press you against the fence, and they start, they start to feel it. They start to feel the cadence, the rhythm. I'm, I'm in a fight now. We're good. When a striker gets the layoff, they have to find a striking cadence. And it just seems, I'm no expert, it just seems like it takes longer for the strikers coming off those layoffs to find the rhythm, to find the cadence, to start to feel comfortable in the octagon. That is the one thing that worries me is the layoff. I think McCall Figlak is the much better fighter in this matchup. Certainly the more dangerous guy. I'm on him. I have a half a unit on him at minus 125. His odds right now are minus 153. So for those of you who said, ah, it's a week off, I'll take a week off. Just know that premium membership was grinding. Premium membership, every analyst except Jacob had their picks up, had their bets up. A week early, mind you. This video coming out today, this is on time. The video I did last week, that was early. The bets I did last week, that was early. Artem's picks last week, that was early. Pick Dr. Picks, that was early. This is on time. We do have the picks up. We do have the bets up. I have three bets on this card. I beat the line movement on every single one of them. And that is important to note because when we do hit these off weeks, and I don't think we hit another one for a long time. I think we're in another long stretch here. When we do hit the off weeks, everybody likes to take a deep breath and relax. I don't. I just keep grinding forward. But my point to you is if you are a premium member, just go to your account page and link your Discord. 
You don't need to log into the website and continue to hit refresh. Obviously, you have to go to the website to use the tools, to read the write-ups and do all of that stuff. But if you just want to be alerted when a bet is placed, link your Discord. You will get an alert on your phone through the Discord app when a bet is placed. You would have seen this bet and two others that I have where we beat the line movement instead of waiting till fight week where you're not going to get as good of odds. I love McCall Figlack at a half a unit at minus 125. Now he's chilling in the minus 150 something range. I think it's still okay. But if he starts to get to minus 160, 70, 80, I think he's too far gone. The two-year layoff is a little too risky. If you're not a premium member, become one. It's $10. It is by far the best way to support us. And obviously, it costs a couple of dollars. If you don't want to spend the money, you still want to support us, please subscribe. Please like. Here's a little tangent for you. We have about 24,000 subscribers. I think we're 100 people away from 24,000 subscribers. Uh, which is spectacular. Thank you all very, very much. We've cruised past four and a half million. We might have five million views at this point. We, our subscriber to view ratio is a little wonky. We, by far in this space, do the best views. And this space doesn't include uh, personalities. This space is the picking space, the breaking down full cards, giving you picks and bets. By far the most amount of views in this space. But we don't have by far the most amount of subscribers. Views are king. Views matter more than anything because that means people are continuing to watch the content. Views and the length of time. We dominate all of those statistics. So my call to action is please click the subscribe button. If you're watching this video and you don't subscribe, click the subscribe button. It's very, very helpful. And it does a lot of things for us. It tells YouTube, well, they like this content enough to click that extra button. They click the like, they click the subscribe. Let's put this content in front of more eyes. So thank you in advance for that. Then we have the biggest favorite on the card, Victor Henry taking on Ronnie Yaya. And this is a, take a guess, who won their last fight? Neither one of them. And Victor Henry's credit, this is a little different because it's a no contest. Okay, finally, finally, we're on the fifth fight of the night and I'm finally, actually sixth fight of the night and I finally hit somebody that is not coming off a loss. He's not coming off a win, but he's not coming off a loss. Ronnie Yaya, on the other hand, is knocked out flat by Montel Jackson. Victor Henry, that no contest with Javid Vajarat where his balls were treated like a soccer ball and they had to end that fight early. We got Ronnie Yaya. This guy is a phenomenal, incredible grappler. Very high level BJJ. He has 40 professional fights. He's been around very long. Certainly long enough to develop other skills as well. But grappling is without a doubt his bread and butter. He is relentless with takedown attempts. He only has a 32% accuracy, which seems low. But considering he is just diving at legs instantly, it's impressive. He has almost three takedowns per fight on average. And when he gets it to the ground... Even if he doesn't submit you immediately, he's got great control. He keeps you worried. And the fact that you're trying to stand up and you know this guy's on your back, you know this guy's holding you down, makes it a little tricky. I would also like for the record, I want it to be noted that you're, if you notice a jump cut there, it's not because my lisp is back and I fumbled some words. I had to sneeze. We got Victor Henry. This guy is a come forward striker, a wide variety of attacks. He likes to plot forward. He uses head movement to avoid punches. He'll throw literally everything at you. At range, he's going to throw head kicks. If he's inside the pocket, he'll throw elbows and knees. Ton of variety. He mixes it together really well. I mentioned that low blow with Javid Bajrad. He did look decent early, but he was also a tremendous underdog. And this is a pretty simple breakdown. Ronnie has incredible grappling skills. But this is a young man's game, especially at 135 pounds. And Victor Henry isn't exactly Mr. Youth, but he's certainly not 40. And he certainly hasn't looked old yet. Ronnie Aya officially looked old. In his last fight, it was the slowest we have ever seen him. And then he was knocked unconscious. Good things don't happen in this sport from that point on. It's a very unforgiving sport. It's a very unrelenting sport. And the only thing that we can do as fans is at least show the proper respect to these guys. Ronnie Yaya was never a household name. Ronnie Yaya never was about to fight for a title. But the dude came out there, gave us some pretty exciting fights and would grind and would work for us and put on a show for us. So while I am going to pick Victor Henry, I'm not touching that line. Minus 500 on a very inconsistent guy. If he loses to Ronnie, this would... And it's it's Hani with an H. But I'm just going to keep saying Ronnie because sorry. If Victor loses to Hani, it would not even be the first 40-year-old that he lost to. He lost to Rafael Asuncao like a year or two ago, who was also 40 at the time. So Victor Henry, way too unreliable for these odds. I am confident that he wins. 
He is going to be the pick. And if he was minus 150, I'd love it. Minus 500? Kick rocks, dude. No thanks. And here I'm going to pause and offer you $50. Some people took a bath at UFC 300. And not because it was the hardest card in the world to pick, but just because it was an interesting card to pick. A couple of the really good underdogs didn't make it happen. A couple of the really big favorites didn't make it happen. Jalen Turner in particular. If you'd like $50, you want to recoup some of that money, just go to wewantpicks.com slash bets. Sign up with any one of the partners using the links on the page, make a deposit, and we send you $50 as a thank you. It's actual money that we send you. Like I literally send it from my bank account and it gets sent to your PayPal, your Venmo, or your Cash App. So this isn't like, oh, if you sign up, you'll get $50 in bonus betting money. No, you get actual real life human money. We want picks.com slash bets. Sign up, make a deposit. It's only 50. Here's another little call to action. This is free. Obviously we ask you guys to sign up for premium. That's not free, but this is free. If you could follow the socials, that would be very helpful for two reasons. One helps us grow. Two, if you remember the people who have been here for a little while, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, or maybe exactly a year ago, one of my servers, and I'll spend more time on this in the future, but one of my servers, I had a movie server. It was hacked. And when I say hacked, it, I downloaded something like a fucking idiot. And then they got a hold of all of my passwords and logins. The first thing that they did was change my Google password. Google owns YouTube. I had no access to the YouTube channel. None. For They fixed it in about 36 hours, 24 hours, something like that. But it was very nerve wracking. And the content that we produce on those days immediately got put up in the Discord, immediately got put on other platforms. So if you could follow us on all the socials, that would be helpful. Not only does it help us grow across the board, but also it's a great backup plan. God forbid I end up clicking another bad link. I think I've made all the right decisions and I'll, I'll be transparent because you're going to be like, he clicked a porn link. No. What happened was is somebody reached out and said, Hey, we'd love the show. We'd love to sponsor you. We'd love to, if you could do an ad read for us. And I was like, well, I don't, and I turn down sponsors all the time. I was like, I don't really like ad reads because if I'm going to spend 30 seconds inside of my video, the only product I'll promote is something that I actually use like bet openly, or I'm going to promote my own product. I sell premium. I'm going to spend the 30 seconds on myself, on Jacob, on Josh. I'm going to spend the time to help that because that helps all of us, not for a quick thousand bucks or whatever you're offering me. And they're like, well, how much? So I was like, all right, three grand for 30 seconds. And they're like, we could do that. And then I checked them all out. There's a full website that said they're developing a gaming app. Full website, fully interact. Like, it all looked legit. And then they said, here's the offer letter. The offer letter was a, it said .pdf. And I'm running this, everything I'm doing for you right now. I'm running this on a MacBook. And I tried to open the attachment on the MacBook. And the MacBook was like, nah, dude, don't open this. I'm not opening this for you. And I was like, what the hell's wrong? Why isn't this opening? So then I took that file and I moved it to my Windows media server and I opened it on that. And it was like a virus or Trojan, whatever it's called. And that's how it all happened. So learn the lesson that I learned. And the lesson is be careful what you click. If you try to open a file and your MacBook, which is secure, won't let you open it, move on be like, hey, didn't let me open this. And then two, don't keep your password saved in Chrome. That was actually my undoing. It's not like I have banking records on my media server. The issue was on that server, I was logged into Chrome and all of my passwords were saved in Chrome. So all they did, the quote unquote hackers, was export my saved passwords. And then they had a login and a password for every single thing in my life, everything. So since then, no more passwords are saved in Chrome. Literally no passwords are saved in anything. I use one pass or one password, whatever it's called. And that uses biometrics to unlock anything. And then I locked all my credit bureaus and all that stuff. So it ended up being harmless, at least for the time being. It's been about a year. But I do get an insane amount of robocalls and stuff like that because they exported my profile and then they sold it on the dark web a hundred times over. And all I can do is protect myself with locking my credit down and all that. But either way, if you could follow the socials and just be careful because quote unquote hacking isn't real hacking. There's not some weird nerd kid with a hoodie like that's not what they're doing. They're trying to trick you, trying to get you to click a link and then install something on your computer. And then from there, they just take whatever they want to take. 
Then we have the main card opener. Tim Means taking on Uros Medik. Finally, finally, we had to get to the main card before one fighter was coming off of a win, and that is Tim Means. He finished Andre Fialo. But Uros Medic, on the other hand, he's coming off a grappling loss to Miktik Orlobai. This could be a really fun fight, though, because Tim Means is a gritty, high-volume striker who's going to work in takedowns if he can. He's got that tricky striking because of that karate style, and he's constantly switching his lead leg. It's hard to put him in any single category or give him one path to victory because he is a well-rounded guy. He can grind out a wrestling win. He can hang tough in the striking. He's the dirty bird, and that's how he's going to fight. He's taking an Uros Medik. Uros Medik is a clean striker. He comes out fast. He comes out loose. 100% finish rate in his nine wins. He's got speed. He's got power. He's got legit killer instinct. If he thinks that you're hurt, if he smells blood, he will go for broke. Takedown defense sits at a low 46%, but that is skewed because he was just taken down seven times in his last fight. And even though I mentioned Tim Means is coming off a win, that win is against a guy that's no longer in the UFC, and it did break a three-fight skit. Tim Means is 40. And that is a concern. But 40 at welterweight is a little bit different than 40 at 135 pounds. This still should, in fact, be Uros Medic all day long. He should be younger, faster, stronger, the better striker by far, and the more dangerous guy. The striking, no problem. The takedown defense is the only thing I worry about because Tim Means, crafty veteran. You have 33 plus 15, that is 48 fights. I mean, I just... That's not in my notes. That's just that you know that high caliber Connecticut education where I'm just doing math looking at. You know those video games where it's like the soldiers moving forward and then there's a gate that's like plus 12 soldiers divided by three and then the other choice is like plus three then divide by 12. I dominate those things. And it's, it's just because of the... the uh, uh, people are like, is he autistic? Like, how is he so good at math? If you threw a deck of cards in the air, I would probably uh, 12. Like, done. Instantly. Anyway, 48 fights for Tim Means, and that comes with a lot of experience. Maybe enough experience to say, I should wrestle here. But he is still 40. He is slowing down. He's never been particularly dangerous, even though he is very tough. Uros Medic should win this fight. I am very confident in him to win this fight. I don't know if I trust these odds just yet. Let's wait for the prop bets to see what we get here. But... Uros Medic, never been to a decision. So if he wins, he's finishing Tim Means. And if he loses, he's getting finished. Let's hope for a two and a half round line, and then we can go ahead and blast the under. Then we have one of my more confident picks on this card. I have a bet on this fight, and guess what? I did beat the odds here as well. We got Jonathan Pierce taking on David Onama. Jonathan Pierce embarrassed himself a little bit in his last fight, so he is coming off of a loss. He was dominating Joe Anderson Brito, taking him down, controlling him. And then he did some redneck hick bullshit, was like, get up, boy. And then literally, Joe Anderson Brito submitted him within, within like a minute of that. It, it just made him look so stupid. It made him look just so dumb. So he's coming off a loss. David Onam, on the other hand, is coming off a nice win. He did knock out Gabriel Santos in his last outing. Jonathan Pierce, solid wrestler. He's going to come forward. He's going to set a nice pace, both on the feet and on the ground. Decent takedowns, good BJJ. He averages almost six takedowns per fight, which tells you he struggles a little bit with the control. But if you stand back up, all he's going to do is shoot is another takedown. And he's going to stay on your hips. He's going to continue to move forward. On the ground, he's typically looking for a TKO instead of a submission. In 19 fights, he has only been to a decision three times. He does leave it all out there. And obviously, when you see that, when you see his pace, it is very impressive. The fact that this guy can average almost six takedowns per fight and just continue to move forward at that pace is very, very impressive. He is fun to watch. He's got to take one to give one striking style, but primarily a wrestler, and that's what we're going to be looking for him to do here because David Onama is a very good striker. He's a very good kickboxer, and Jonathan Pierce isn't going to win a pure kickboxing match here. Onama likes to plot forward. He likes to control the pace. Typically, he's not very high volume, but he is effective. He's got a super long jab that he's constantly throwing out there, but he does tend to throw just one or two punches at a time instead of full-blown combinations. If he is in the clinch, that's when we'll see a little bit more activity out of him. He can back up, and have some props. 
If you stay in his face and you move him backwards, he does not like that. He likes to come forward. He likes to use that long jab and then send something behind it. But backing up, you can sort of, I don't want to say break him because he's not a quitter, but backing up, you can give him a hard time and he falls out of that rhythm and it's a hard time for him to lead that jab while leaning backwards. Anyway, Jonathan Pierce is going to be the pick. I have a half a unit bet on him. I got him at minus 140. He is now chilling at minus 170. And it is quite literally only because of the wrestling. Somebody tagged me or added me, whatever you want to call it, in the Discord and said, hey, Angelo, why are you so high on Jonathan Pierce? And then my reply was, I wrote literally the wrestling. That's it. It's the, re it's the wrestling. That's it. I don't think David Onama is going to stop all the takedowns. Nate the Train was able to take him down and get it done. I think Jonathan Pierce does the same. The guy is a relentless wrestler. He's taking down everybody. He's doing it really well. And despite looking like an absolute clown shoe in that last fight, he was still dominating that fight. And I think he's going to dominate this one as well. So Jonathan Pierce is the pick, and I do have that bet on him. Then we have Austin Lane taking on Shonata Denise. Austin Lane coming off a loss. No surprises there. But Jonathan, or Jonata, I think it's Jonathan. Maybe not. Jonata Denise. And it's funny because I, I have to watch tape, right? Somebody's going to be like, well, don't you watch tape? You don't hear the name? How could I break down somebody that's never fought in the UFC if I don't watch tape? I obviously watch the tape. I also watch tape on, think about how many fighters I break down a week. So by that time, and I'm more than a week ahead. I'm two weeks ahead. I already have UFC 301 ready to go. I have a massive bet for UFC 303 that premium members saw. So I am weeks ahead. The problem is, uh, you know how many names I hear, how many announcers in different languages and different inflections on their voice I hear, it, it definitely gets all jarbled. So let's just say Jonathan Denise taking on Austin Lane. Jonathan, prospect, contender series guy, is undefeated in his career, so obviously one of the very few on this card coming off a win. He is a good striker. He's got clean technique, incredible power. He unlike some others, does throw in combinations. He's got clean defense, great speed for his size, and professional kickboxing experience. His takedown defense is solid, but it is relatively untested. There's not a ton of fights that you can find of him defending takedowns. He's only 6-0, but he does have six stoppages. Taking on Austin Lane. I mention this every single time, but it's important to note. He is a former professional football player. He's a very big, very athletic guy. He started his MMA career about eight years ago. He's large, he's powerful, he's athletic. He's competed at the highest level in sports. He's fast for his size, and he does like to sort of jump in with the strikes, throw a bunch of flurry, and then jump out. He can grapple, and he likes to work you against the cage, slow the pace. He does not like firefights. He's not one of those guys. He's not like a Greg Hardy for all of his faults and as not great as he was as a fighter. He wasn't afraid to stand there and strike. Austin Lane is not that guy. Austin Gain Lane doesn't want to stand there in a slugfest and strike. He wants to either be on the outside like or leap in, touch you, and go, or he wants to look to grapple. Jonathan is going to be the pick here. He is going to be light years better in the straight. He's going to hit harder. He's going to be faster. We just watched Austin Lane get knocked out cold by Justin Taffa. And Jonathan Denise, or Jonathan Denise, has that same power, but better speed and better technique. He should absolutely win here. But we did just watch that loser, slob, China buffet eating bum, Walter Walker, show up and look like he had never been in a fight in his entire life. Dude looked like he would bring the grocery bags from the car to the house exhausted, and he wouldn't even do the cool guy move and get all the bags. He would do multiple trips because he's a lazy bum. And we might have that here with Jonathan Denise because Walter Walker looked good before the octagon, and so does Jonathan. He looks good before the octagon, but sometimes these people show up, they don't knock somebody out in 30 seconds, and then they're clueless. Janata is going to be the pick. Medium level confidence. But until I see you get a win in the octagon, until I see you get a win in the actual UFC, not contender series, in the actual UFC, it is very hard to have any confidence in you whatsoever. Because Austin Lane, we haven't seen a ton of wrestling out of him in the UFC, but he does like to wrestle. And all of a sudden, he holds Janata... Janata against the cage, squeaks him to the ground a little bit. We don't, we don't know what it's going to look like. So Denise is going to be the pick. This could be 
let's see what kind of round line we get. Because this could be that Walter Walker sloppy, disgusting mess type fight where the over one and a half looks like the greatest play of all time. So maybe we get lucky and, and it's a one and a half line and the over is plus 200. Maybe we'll take a look at that. Either way, Janata's going to be the pick because everything we've seen up until this fight, he's going to be faster, he's going to hit harder, he's going to have the better striking technique. So he's got to be the pick. But until we see him in a little bit of trouble, we don't know how he's going to react. And Austin Lane, he's not terrible. He's not terrible. He got knocked out by one of the harder hitting guys in the division. So let's see what happens. This could be an interesting fight. Then we have my favorite bet on the entire card. We have Karini Silva taking on Ariana Lipsky. This is the only fight on this entire card where both fighters are coming off of a win. The only fight on the card where those are the circumstances. And this is actually a good fight. The next three fights are good. The main event is atrocious as far as name value and name recognition for a main event. But entertainment-wise, this could be a good fight. The co-main event could be a good fight. And the main event could be a good fight. We got Karini Silva taking on Ariana Lipsky. And the reason this is going to be a good fight is because you may snap judge Ariana Lipsky and be like, doesn't she suck? And you know what? For a portion of her career, she did kind of suck. She was a pitter-pratter striker that really couldn't do much else. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, she's putting things together. Her last three fights, she's defended 21 takedowns combined. She went four for four on her own takedowns in her last three fights. She just submitted Casey O'Neill, who was supposed to be this big prospect in the division. So Ariana Lipsky, all of a sudden, has put things together. She was always a pretty good striker. And now... We know she can grapple or at least defend takedowns if she needs to. No real finishing ability or stoppage power there. Obviously, she just submitted Casey O'Neill. But Ariana Lipsky is typically a striker that has surprised some people with her grappling. She is taking on Karini Silva, though. You're going to see 17 wins. That's huge. That's 17 stoppage wins. She is absolutely a finisher. She's a powerful grappler who's constantly looking for a submission both top and bottom. 17 wins. 17 stoppages. And that's a mixed bag of ground and pound TKOs or submissions. She is going to plot forward. She's got a tight guard on the feet. She's throw whatever crap she's going to throw at you and then get you to the ground as quickly as possible. On the ground, you're in a world of trouble. She will stay busy on top. She will look for something. She will find something either in a scramble or she will set it up nicely working from a position. She's coming off that first round submission win over Marina Moroz where she had a knockdown and then a guillotine. I will say, Karini Silva doesn't always look spectacular. Yes, 17 wins by finish, but those aren't all clean. Sometimes she just finds herself on the ground. Marina Moroz, I'm pretty sure, took herself down. Other times, she looks like a buzzsaw. I do think Karini Silva wins this fight. I am also going to give Ariana Lipsky the credit she deserves. She has evolved. We don't very often see fighters be like very mid-level, very too one-dimensional, whatever, and then all of a sudden start to put the actual pieces together and then improve. Ariana Lipsky has quietly, behind the scenes, been improving, been getting better, and all of a sudden is good. This is a very good matchup. I do like Karini Silva here. I bet her at plus 118. Plus 118 underdog. Which means if I bet $100, they would give me my 100 back and 118 of profit. She is now the minus 140 favorite. And I was positive that was going to happen. I was positive that the woman with 17 fights and 17 finishes was going to be the favorite. The pick here is Karini Silva. I think she can get it to the ground. I think she can make something happen. Karini Silva's the pick, and hopefully you were a premium member so you saw that bet before the line moved. And then we have the co-main event of the evening with spectacular new graphics. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I made some slight adjustments to the graphics here. Two things of note. One, you're going to see the official UFC Fight Night banner up top. That's how the UFC does their posters. So I said, you know what? Let's make this look as close to the UFC posters as possible. So we have that nice little banner. What you're also going to see is the background. I didn't randomly choose a background. What I did was, this is the official background that the UFC is using for this card. If you go to the UFC's website and you click on this event, that red to teal, I think I got those colors correct. Tiffany thinks I'm colorblind. I am not. That red to teal spectrum there, that's the official color background. And that's what you can expect going forward. And it's the little details that matter because that was not easy to do. The official, first of all, it's almost impossible to find a, a 
the actual clean image without text all over it. So what you have to do, it, I'm not even going to tell you how to do it. I'm not even going to tell you how to do it. So I have to find the clean image, which I do every time. Then I had to use graphic software, artificial intelligence to remove things and replace things and make it super clean. So a little bit of respect for your homie putting in work in the off week just to make these graphics a touch nicer. They already were the best in the game. Look at the stats you have on the screen. They're, everybody that's just screen grabbing topology while they do their bullshit breakdowns, no offense, Artem, no time there, no effort. At least Artem has a nice overlay. They look at the graphics. You got takedown averages, takedown defense, percent strikes landed per minute. You got the biometrics. Look at the data you get here. And then in the full Tuesday breakdown, you get the odds. I mean, come on, guys. Pour one out. I'm not dead, but pour one out for your homie. We got Ryan Spann coming off that loss. Two losses. Taking on Bogdan Guskov. Everybody says he looks exactly like Anthony Smith. And if we go like this, just a little, maybe. Maybe a touch. I actually don't see it as much as other people do. Even Anthony Smith, it's the nose is why everybody says it. But either way, we got Ryan Spann. Massive, humongous, six foot five, very dangerous Ryan Spann. The guy's a powerhouse. He has an 81 inch reach or a 79 inch reach, literally depending on where you look it up. Topology is going to have a different number than UFC stats, but I'm going to, I'm going to, either way, whether it's 79 or 81, it's an incredible reach. And it is kind of wild that there's not like one single authoritative truth when it comes to that stuff. He's got 21 wins with 18 stoppages. And it's not just all one punch knockout power. He's got plenty of submissions in there as well. He also can wrestle. He averages more than one takedown per fight. 12 of those stoppages, 12 of the 19 or the 18 stoppages are by submission. Most of his stoppages are by submission. And that's because people are so worried about how dangerous of a striker he is that he will snatch something up in a scramble. He'll grab a guillotine. He'll TKO you. He'll beat on you until you turn and Jalen Turner yourself. But either way, Ryan Spann, dangerous striker who can wrestle, who is a submission threat as well. He does have some cardio. He can be a threat for an entire 15 minutes, not just the first five. And he is coming off that decision loss to Anthony Smith, where I think he won that fight. He did land fewer strikes if we're just looking at totals, but... All everybody talks about now is how damage is the most important thing in the world, and he definitely had the damage in that fight. He's taking on Bogdan Guskov. He doesn't have a ton of fights in the UFC, but the fact that he's in a co-main event, I'm assuming it's because he's somebody the UFC wants to push. He's certainly an exciting guy to watch. He's a heavy-handed guy, likes to come forward, likes to throw big, likes to mix things up. When he's striking, he can be fast, and he can have some very real power. He keeps his hands low, but he has decent footwork and nice combinations. If he doesn't get an early knockout or have enough success striking, he will then change up a game plan. He'll push you to the cage or try to get you to the ground. On top, he actually surprisingly, he doesn't seem like the type of guy, but on top, he will have patience. He will take his time. He will look for control and he'll ride you out while striking, but not get overly aggressive. He did just finish Zach Pauga, who I don't think is in the UFC any longer. And Ryan is on a two fight skit. And then you may look at that and say, why the hell's a guy that just lost two fights in a row, a two to one favorite. But the reality is that they're decent losses. The Nikita Krylov fight was a mess. It was a very quick loss, but it was a mess. That fight was booked, canceled, rebooked. There was weight cutting. Like, that fight was a disaster. So it is what it is. And then I think he beat Anthony Smith. I genuinely think he won that last fight. I don't think that was the best decision. But either way, Anthony Smith is a former title challenger, a formidable opponent. That's, that's a quality loss. He's old as shit, but that's still a quality loss, if you will. So he's the favorite because he has far more experience, and he's a very, very dangerous guy. Ryan is a giant guy and he is durable. And the durability, I think, is the biggest difference here. Because I think Bogdan may land some good punches, may have a little bit of success, and I don't think it's going to matter. He certainly has enough power to one-punch knock out Ryan Span, but I don't think he will. And then now he's in, uh-oh, uh-oh, I'm in a locked cage with somebody much larger who hits much harder than me, who has way more experience than I do. And I think Ryan Spann is going to win this fight. I think he can keep the fight standing. He can get it to the ground if he needs to. I think he will wear on Bogdan over the course of the 15 minutes. I don't think this is a quick fight. 
I think it's likely a decision. Or if there is a late stoppage, I think it's Ryan Spann. I think Bogdan's going to fade quickly and look worse and worse as the fight goes on after having some early success. I think he will connect early. Ryan might even be in a little bit of trouble early. And then he'll survive, push through, take over. Ryan Spann is going to be the pick. But I am curious to see this matchup. This is at least, I mean, Ryan Spann... I think he's ranked. He might be the only ranked fighter on this card. But Ryan Spann is at least a name. And Bogdan is seemingly a guy the UFC wants to push. Let's I mean the light heavyweight division is kind of terrible. So it's like let's let's see what we can do for the light heavyweight division, build some other contenders. Because I went through the light heavyweight rankings. So obviously Alex Bajeda is champ. And then you go through the only fight. The only fight is Ankalaev. Everybody else is either coming off of a loss or Alex Bahia to beat them. Like, it's actually crazy how bad the rankings are in that division. So, UFC is probably trying to breathe some life into it with Bogdan. But Ryan Spann is going to be the pick because of experience. I don't know if I trust him enough to bet on him. And then we have the main event of the evening. Listen, I'm about to trash this main event. Again, this is not a reflection on the fighters themselves. Because Mateusz Nikolaou is a very good fighter. A very good fighter. And Alex Perez just gave us a dog fight against Mohamed Mikhaev. So I'm not trashing the fighters. When I say this is a terrible main event, it's not, oh, you're terrible, Nikolaou. You're terrible, Perez. It's supposed to be a big fight. A big fight. Either two very well-known people or two people where somebody's going to get a win and earn themselves a title shot. Something. Something. We have none of that. We have none of that. There's no name recognition here at all. Mateusz Nikolaou was just knocked out cold by Brandon Royval in his last fight. Alex Perez, while he did just fight Mikhaev and did make it look decent, he hasn't won a fight in four years. He doesn't have a single win over anybody that is actively in the UFC right now. And I get, he's stepping up on short notice, so you can't blame Perez. This was supposed to be Nikolaou versus Cop, and then Cop backed out, so this is what you get. But this is just a ter- this is a terrible just they should have just made Ryan Spann the main event. I don't know what like again, I'm not dogging the fighters because they're the ones without them we got nothing. I am appreciative that there is even a fight night to watch because last night there was no fighting to watch and I went stir crazy as hell. So I appreciate that we have the fights. I don't want to sound like a sourpuss. But what I do want to say, it's it's the quality difference between some of these cards is crazy. Almost every, and I, I get UFC 300 had to be the biggest card of all time and it somehow delivered. Any one of those undercard, literally any one of those undercard fights, any one of them would have been a better main event because they had name recognition, former world champions, like a whole bunch of narratives. There is no narrative here, nothing. Like, what is it? And no. What, what is that guy, that voice? What is he going to say for this main event? What Literally, what is it going to be? It's not going to be like a Brazilian hammer coming off of t- six wins in a row with nine knockout. Like, what is the promo here? A delicate striker with not much of a chin who was just knocked unconscious is taking on a man who hasn't won a fight in four years but is looking to revive his career tonight on ESPN+. Plus. That's uh, that is literally the promo. Anyway, we got Matouche Nicolau taking on Alex Perez, and now we're going to speak highly of the fighters because again, I don't have an issue with the fighters. It's the matchmaking, and actually, let me back up again. It's not even the match. This is a great matchup, and this will be an exciting fight. It's the fact that it's the main event. We got Matouche Nicolau. This guy is a good clean striker he is incredibly technical he's also a very competent grappler as well with 10 takedowns in eight ufc wins two of those takedowns were against his original opponent manel cop and credit to alex for stepping up on short notice when mataus gets you to the ground he will stick with control he will work towards a submission when it presents itself instead of chasing and getting reckless he did just snap a six fight win streak with an early knockout loss to Brandon Royval. That loss does hold a lot of credit and credence because Brandon Royval just looked absolutely spectacular in his last fight. Matouche Nicolau is a very, very good fighter who probably wins this fight. He's taking on Alex Perez. Alex Perez is a very good striker with fantastic low kicks, good wrestling. His low kicks are so devastating that in his last win, which was 
an eternity ago was literally by leg kicks. He just chopped down Juicy A. Formiga's legs until that was the end of that. He does come in with some solid combinations. He finishes those exchanges with those leg kicks. He averages more than two takedowns per fight. He's got an impressive 82% takedown defense, but he is coming off that decision loss to Muhammad Makayev, where, frankly, the takeaway from that fight, people wanted to say, oh, Makayev's not that good, and then Makayev said that he had a, a staph infection. My takeaway was, like, Alex Perez is a dog. And he's tough as shit. His scramble skills were impressive, and he was there. Alex Perez could have won that fight. The issue was he was coming off a long layoff, and he didn't let his hands go. He just did not let his hands go. I don't know if he was, like, you know, the layoff was an issue, or he was so worried about the takedowns that he felt like if he overcommitted to something, he would get shot on, but he did a spectacular job working in scrambles, defending most of the takedowns, getting up if he was taken down. He just didn't let his hands go. If he let his hands go... He probably would have won that fight. So this is actually a very good fight. There's no name recognition whatsoever. It's an absurd main event. But the actual the 25 minutes we're going to get in that cage could be a ton of fun. Very technical striker in Matos Nikolaou versus a dog in Alex Perez. And if Alex Perez got that fight out of his system, we talked earlier in this video about strikers coming off long layoffs. His last fight against Mohamed Makayev was a long layoff. And let's say he got that out of his system. He's now ready to fight to his full potential. Alex Perez at his full potential could beat Matos Nikolaou. But I do think Matos is going to be too fast, too accurate, and he does have the grappling chops if needed. Matos Nikolaou is going to be the pick. What concerns me, though, is the fact that he was just knocked out. And sometimes that changes somebody. Sometimes... That'll create a world where you don't commit anymore. You're afraid you're going to get knocked out again. So Mataus is going to be calculated. He's going to be accurate. He's going to be patient. And he is the more technical fighter here. Mataus Nikolaou is the pick to get back on track. Guys, that is the breakdown. If you could do us a favor and become a premium member, that would be outstanding. If you also want to send something, the second slide in this entire breakdown was the Fight Foods vlog. We film a vlog for every single UFC pay-per-view. We typically do a mail day on those vlogs. Everything for people who mail us letters. This isn't me asking for you to mail us something physical, but people will mail letters. And if you want to send a letter, if you want to send your shirt for your small business that you want to promote, I am happy to wear it during the vlog. This is the address if you want to send anything. The next pay-per-view is in two weeks, and we'll go ahead and open the mail on that pay-per-view. If you can, become a premium member. It's only $10 for an entire month. You're going to unlock the tools like the line movement tracker, the detailed data metrics and analytics, but you're also going to get the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game, and those will be preloaded into the optimizer. The optimizer, you click a few buttons, it builds some lineups for you. Very simple, very easy, and finally, you're going to get far more than just this specimen of a man. You're going to get Artem and right now is when you should hop on that Artem train because he's breaking down PFL and we're in the regular season of the PFL. Contender Series ramps up this summer. He's going to be breaking down all of those. All of his write-ups, his picks, his bets, all of that will be on premium for you as well as the pick doctor. The artificial intelligence picking fights at a pretty remarkable rate. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It is only $10 for an entire month and I'll give you five months worth of money we want picks.com slash bets. Sign up, make a deposit, and we will send you 50 bucks as a thank you. Guys, that is the breakdown. We're closing in on 24,000 subscribers on YouTube. I appreciate every last one of you. Uh, a fight week or an off week is always interesting because, well, I did get a break and it was nice that I didn't have to do certain things throughout the week. We still did two call-in shows, and we do that because it's like I feel this like overwhelming obligation to you guys. I feel like I have to provide something. And in fact, I got an email from somebody saying, hey, how come your picks are up and Artem's picks are up and the artificial intelligence picks are up, but Jacob's aren't? And I took, I sort of, it sort of bothered me a little bit because it's like, wait a minute, you know, there's no fights this week. Like you realize that there are no fights this week at all. So my picks being up, those are a week early. Artem's are a week early. The artificial intelligence is a week early. The line moving tracker, early. The data metrics, early. Jacob's not late. He will be on time. 
which is the Sunday before every single fight week. So I do feel this overwhelming obligation to make premium the best thing on the planet, to put out content, to provide videos. And I hope you guys all appreciate that because I appreciate you. Thanks for the watch and back to normal fight week this week.